So today let's explore what's inside of a traffic light. This one is the newer one, LED based, and of course traffic lights are a very common optical illusion. When you see them in distance they look about 10 or 12 centimeters in diameter. Roughly the diameter of a CD disc, but in reality they're actually much bigger. And this one is actually still one of the smaller ones. This one is 20 centimeters in diameter, but I guess most of them are 30 centimeters in diameter. And this one is already LED based. The older ones, of course, were using tungsten lamps, quite powerful. This one says 200 millimeters yellow. And of course in some countries they call it yellow, in some countries they call it orange. Here it says gelb in German, 230 volts. And, and there is a date code, 2013, so it's a bit old. This is probably when they started replacing the tungsten lamps with LEDs. 230 volts, AC plus 10, minus 15%, percent, 50 hertz. Power consumption over 8 watts. Shouldn't it be the other way? Typically appliances say the worst case or maximum power consumption. And made in Austria. Imagine that. There are still some electronics not made in China. And now of course let's try to test it. It has this minus voltage inlet here. So let's just try to connect my doji test plug to it and let's see if it's yellow or orange. Or we can just call it the Slemon the gas traffic light. Let's try to plug it in and see. And it works. It's either yellow or orange. You be the judge. But of course the camera might not convey the color very accurately anyway. And it has Fresnel or Fresnel lens on it. And it's very directional. It produces a very narrow beam and you can see from the side it looks very dim. And looking at the ceiling it actually projects three points. So I guess it contains three LEDs in it and the Fresnel lens. But it of course might have had another diffuser over this. This is clear. Maybe there was an orange or yellow diffuser on top of that. But of course the traffic light is meant to be sort of a narrow angle because there is also a narrow angle of directions where you are meant to see it from. And I noticed when I unplug it and plug it back, sometimes it works, sometimes not. Well, now it seems to work all the time, but off camera it was working. I unplugged it and plugged it back and it was not working. So I guess it's a bit intermittent and this is probably the reason they replaced it. And let's take a look at the marking. It actually says top here, which means the LEDs are in it horizontally and also the horizontal angle of the light is wider than the vertical one. And does it flicker? I switched the camera to 24 frames a second instead of 50 and you can see a little bit of a flicker or a little bit of a rolling shutter effect. So the current for the LEDs is smooth a bit but not perfectly. Now it seems to work all the time. It's no longer intermittent but it was. But anyway, now let's try to pry it open because I guess it's glued either or the cover clicks in. Well, it just clicks. No glue. It was easier than I expected. And there is some sort of a baffle around it. Not on the top, but on all other sides. So this seems to be designed for a specific lighting angle or pattern. And of course it has the horrible hex or torx screws in it, which I never liked. So let's remove them. All the screws are out and this comes out and it reveals the power supply. Nice. And you could actually start a fire with this or at least burn something. But let's go back to this. Here is the power supply and the LED board, which was held in a place using this, and the board was also mounted onto this using this screw with a plastic washer. And it already came off. And let's take a closer look at it. And it's bloody complex. And the cable goes to the LED board. Nothing here, and three LEDs here. 
with a ton of resistors here, but all seem to be in a parallel. There's a current limiting resistor and also a current sensing resistor, maybe. What kind of LEDs are these? Are they more chips in a series? No, it's a single chip yellow LED, non-phosphor based. It's dropping about 1.7 volts at a low current, and I guess about 1.9 volts at a higher current. All of them are working, and they're in series. And this tester produces about 10 volts. It should light up all three in series. Well, it doesn't because the power supply circuitry is pulling the voltage down, I guess. Now it actually lights up all three. And the board has spaces on it for two power transistors, but they are not used. Just some zero ohm jumpers here and all the resistors here. And here is the power supply, which has the main as voltage coming in, 230 volts. Here is the interference capacitor, 33 nano, 275 volts. A 10 ohm resistor in a series to limit the inrush current, and also to limit the current if this overvoltage metal oxide varistor starts conducting. And then some interference inductors, interference capacitors, 22 nano, 400 volts. Some diode, another capacitor, another inductor. There is one transistor, another capacitor. This is probably the secondary side rectification diode, just two pins, another diode, some snubber network with this capacitor and some resistors and diodes, I guess. This secondary capacitor, it's 680 microfarads, 35 volts. A bit high voltage rating given that the LEDs in series probably drop about 6 volts. Here's the transformer, or maybe just an inductor, and a power transistor on a heat sink, which is sort of loose here. A small capacitor, some zero ohm resistors or jumpers, and on the other side there is a lot of it. For a power supply powering just 8 watts of LEDs, this really looks bloody overcomplicated. It has a 14 pin control chip here, but also 7 discrete transistors. On top of that, some diodes, resistors, capacitors, a ton of them, a lot of space for even more of discrete components, and here is the bridge rectifier. And I don't see any isolation gap. This doesn't seem like an isolated power supply. The LEDs are not isolated from a main, as it seems. The transformer has two windings, five pins, one unused. It actually has a primary and a secondary, but one pin of the primary is connected with one pin of the secondary, so it's not an isolated power supply. But of course it doesn't have to be. The LEDs are safely in a plastic box. They don't have to be isolated from a main. And looking at it, it doesn't really look like an ordinary switching power supply or LED driver. This is probably specifically designed for this application. It has no smoothing capacitor on the primary side. No electrolytic 400 volt capacitor anywhere. This probably rectifies the main, but uses no smoothing. And the switching power supply runs on the pulsing 100 Hz on a smooth voltage. And of course this has some advantages. There is no inrush when it turns on. There is also less of a turn on delay. And of course also a shorter turn off delay. And this light has to respond to the power turning on and off much faster than a normal LED driver. The traffic light has to be fast. And also having no primary smoothing capacitor improves the power factor. You would say this is the primary switching transistor. This is the secondary rectification diode, but what the hell is then this transistor? And you can see the transformer. I guess this is the secondary, a thicker wiring, and the primary is probably under it. But I probably already know why it was intermittent and why it was replaced. This thing is loose, it has broken solder joints. Just for fun, let's try to fix it. Let's remove the green paint and let's put some rosin on it. And some solder, the more the better, of course. Even more solder. And it's nicely fixed. And the marking of the chip. And the detail of the LEDs. And I'm a bit confused what material is the box. This piece that broke off seems to be plastic, but the bottom of it is probably aluminium. This is aluminium. How it's actually put together? Where's the edge between the aluminium part and the plastic one? But it's of course a bit heavy for just plastic. This is plastic actually. This is aluminium. 
an aluminium box somehow incorporated into a plastic molding. But now let's test it after the repair. Did I short something? It works nicely. And let's measure the power using my DIY wattmeter. There was about 10.3 watts. And it has a nicely fast response. And of course, being in an aluminium box, this box works as a heat sink. And the LED current is about 666 milliamps. Nice. And the voltage drop is 7.6 volts in total. But then there has to be a lot of power lost. And of course, these resistors are getting hot. Well, the entire board is getting hot. And on this board it measures 10.44 volts at the output. The rest of it is lost on the resistors, I guess. But anyway, now it's nicely working and I could put it back and I can use it as a cool night light. I can of course give it a nice main cable and put it in and install it somewhere. This is definitely cool. This one goes through here. Of course this comes out. And this actually can, I guess, click into this. Of course reusing this thing completely different way then it was intended and it's installed. And looking at one of the windings on a battery powered oscilloscope because it's not isolated from mains of course. And it has no smoothing so you can see the half cycles of mains when you zoom it out and when you zoom it in or use a shorter time base basically, that's the right word for it. You can see some switching pulses. And probing the other winding and the voltage seems to be lower here. The 100 Hz half cycles are smaller. And reducing the time base to see the switching. And now it actually seems to be something square. It seems to be switching at about 54-55 kHz. Now the gate of the transistor with no heat sink. And it actually seems to be running at a variable frequency. I guess the frequency is dynamically adjusted based on the voltage of the half cycles going up and down. And the gate of the other transistor, the one with the heat sink, and the switching, some short pulses. It's not easy to measure because there is the 100 Hz modulation of the voltage and the switching frequency. Let's put one voltage sensing turn through the transformer and sense the voltage on this. And here it's on an analog oscilloscope. And based on how I adjust the synchronization level, it looks different. Now it's at the edge and it synchronizes only at the highest amplitude, so it catches the waveform of the switching only at the top of the main half cycles. That's it, and as I turn the synchronization level, it actually shows the switching waveforms also at lower levels of the half cycles, and it seems like the lower the instantaneous main voltage, the higher the frequency. Can you see this? And of course when I zoom it way out, you can see the half cycles. And here sensing the current it draws from a main using the 10 ohm resistor at the input as a current sensing resistor and it seems the power factor is nicely compensated, almost overcompensated. And the opposite of normal switching power supplies, the half cycles of the sine wave are too rounded maybe. But maybe this is necessary. If it was meant as a retrofit for tungsten lamp fixtures switched by a triac, it has to already draw a lot of current at the beginning of the half cycle to keep the triac on. Maybe that's why the leading side of each half cycle is steeper than the trailing one. And measuring the spectrum of it using my DIY spectrometer after calibrating it using a fluorescent lamp. It peaks at about 592 or 3 nanometers. And it actually visually appears a little bit more orange than a typical yellow LED. And it's interesting how humans have a very good wavelength resolution in the red, orange, yellow, yellow, green part of the spectrum, yet a very poor wavelength resolution in the blue and green. For example, everything from 500 to about 575 nanometers can be described as green, Yet the difference between yellow, green and yellow is about 10 nanometers and the difference between yellow and orange is again about just 10 nanometers. And this is probably evolutionary. For most of their history people were hunters, gatherers. And they needed a very good resolution in this part of the spectrum to tell ripe fruits from unripe. And of course evolution is very slow, so to this very day in their mind these people are still mostly hunters, gatherers. 
every time a human behavior makes absolutely no sense, you just have to remember we got calibrated about a million years ago and then everything suddenly makes a perfect sense and everything clicks together like a puzzle. And this thing definitely could be used as a circadian evening light. I've already built three circadian LED lamps. And of course some people say that the whole thing with circadian lights is a scam, but it seems to work for me. The warmer the light is, the more I have a tendency to sleep. But of course it also got overblown just to sell some overpriced products to people. But still, an orangish light makes your body prepare to sleep, because for millions of years, before sleep you could see the sunlight just before sunset, which is orange, or flames of a fire which are also orange. And again we still mostly have the calibration from when we were hunters gatherers. And I'm starting to hate pictures of a rainbow or spectrum, because the internet seems to get it completely wrong. Every time I try to look up what a certain number of nanometers looks like, or a spectrum with nanometer marks on it, majority of what pops up seems to be completely wrong. I absolutely love this picture of a spectrum with no cyan in it, but even better, it shows the blue and violet as longer waves and the red as the shorter waves here. And of course 490 nanometers should be about cyan and it's green here and 560 nanometers should be still green, it's yellow or orange here, here again no cyan and violet is actually pink. Always be aware that the internet is full of nonsense that can mislead the less experienced ones. Only trust what's congruent with your real life knowledge. And of course the housing with the lens could be reused for a very powerful white LED making a very narrow beam spotlight. So that's it and as always this video is getting bloody long. But if you like my videos please consider subscribing, using the thanks button or becoming my patron on Patreon, because this keeps my channel running. And big thanks to all of you who already support me.